Part four of the introduction to amateur astronomy lecture series is, is entitled Telescope Tutorial, or as I like to call it, the one you've been waiting for. So if you've been watching the lecture series, you have been extremely patient uh, for me to get to us to this part because many people would like part four to be part one because this is the one a lot of people really care about. Uh, but before we really jump into the telescopes, Let's do a little bit of review. So another name for the introduction to amateur astronomy lecture series is Richard Bell's four-step program to become a star hopping sky master. And so that's been my goal during the course of the series here. So I mentioned way back in part two that your first step as an amateur astronomer is not to buy a telescope. It is the worst thing to do if you are just a beginning amateur astronomer. Because if you do get your new telescope, I mean, sure, you'll look at the moon, you'll look at Jupiter, Saturn, maybe a few bright deep sky objects, but eventually you'll, you'll wonder what else is there to look at, or as is usually the case, you'll just buy the wrong telescope altogether, get frustrated with its poor performance because you bought kind of a junky one, and it ends up in the closet, or in the case here, uh, the weight room. And you'll end up selling it in a yard sale for maybe a few bucks, or try to sell it on Craigslist or something like that. So as we started with part one, your goal is to educate yourself. Part one was all about uh, a kind of crash course in basic astronomy, kind of a uh, hour and a half uh, version of a 11 week or 12 week course to you know uh, learn astronomy 101. So it is important to learn basic astronomy because it just gives everything you view through a telescope more meaning when you understand the nature behind it. And of course, there are books that can teach you the, the basics of astronomy. You can just get a good old fashioned astronomy textbook, but I really recommend the Backyard Astronomer's Guide or Nightwatch. Uh, the Practical Astronomer is a pretty good uh, resource as well, but I prefer the latter two or the, the former two, the Backyard Astronomer's Guide and Nightwatch. Uh, they do give you a brief introduction to astronomy, the science of astronomy, but they also uh, are great resources for the beginning amateur astronomer. They cover everything we talked about. And so uh, now that you taught yourself the basics of the science of astronomy and the hobby of amateur astronomy, you need to learn the night sky. It's really important to learn the night sky with your eyes alone. So if you look at a picture like this, you should immediately recognize the three stars in the handle, four stars in the bowl of the Big Dipper. But if you look at this picture and didn't quite realize, hey, look, I can use the pointer stars to point to Polaris. If you didn't catch that fairly quickly, then perhaps you're not quite ready to work your way up to a telescope yet. You've got to learn the night sky because if you have a telescope, eventually you won't know what the point of that because you don't know your way around the night sky. And if you kind of know what you might want to look at, you might not know how to find it because you don't know how to navigate your way around the night sky. So get yourself a monthly all sky star map or a planisphere and learn the bright stars and major constellations of every season. And then of course, buy yourself some binoculars. That's what part three was all about. So binoculars are the halfway point to a telescope. They fill that gap between what you can do with your unaided eye and a telescope. They uh, teach you how to find deep sky objects. And frankly, they're just a lot of fun to use. So get yourself a pair of binoculars. You can get some seven by 50 or 10 by 50 for handheld astronomy, or eventually you can put them on a tripod as shown here, or you can get more advanced and use a binocular chair or a parallelogram mount. And then finally, after all that, once you feel comfortable finding stuff with binoculars, then you're ready for a telescope. And that's where we finally are today. But before we talk about the telescopes themselves, we have to talk about the terminology behind telescopes. 
because, of course, there's terms you might hear that you don't understand. And also, it's a great way to learn about the basic principles and most important features of a telescope. So by far, the most important term for a telescope is its aperture. So the aperture of the telescope is the diameter of either the objective lens or primary mirror, because as you might know, and as we'll talk about today, some telescopes have lenses, some telescopes have mirrors. And so if I say I have a eight inch reflector, that means I'm referring to the size of the primary mirror. The primary mirror of my reflector is eight inches in diameter. Or if I say I have an 80 millimeter refractor, then I have a refractor that has a lens 80 millimeters in diameter. And as you noticed, we always refer to aperture in either millimeters or inches in the US, but probably in say Canada and the United Kingdom, they probably use uh, centimeters a bit more than we do. And so aperture directly relates to light gathering power or light gathering capacity. The it means the same thing. So light gathering power is basically the ability of a telescope to collect light. A very common slang term for a telescope is a light bucket. And that's a really good analogy because imagine you have two buckets, you know, one bucket, you know, it's very tiny, maybe no bigger than a cup. And, uh, and the other bucket is, you know, bucket sized. And if it rains, of course, which one is going to collect more rain? That, of course, is the bigger bucket. So the bigger the lens or mirror, the more light you gather and the brighter things will be. And so in astronomy, this is very important because pretty much everything we look at in the sky, with the exception of the sun with a proper filter, uh, the moon and planets are bright, but everything else is faint. So uh, in short, bigger the better but there are other considerations to take into account and that's what we'll talk about today now i'm sure you're wondering hey richard uh how could i express light gathering power mathematically well let's go ahead and do that so yes today there's a lot more math than what you may have seen before but don't worry if you're a bit of a mathophobe i will walk you through it so here we have the equation for the area of a circle. So the area and diameter of a circle are related by the area is equal to pi times the radius squared. Now, of course, the radius is half the diameter. So here we have the diameter divided by two. So the radius is equal to D divided by two. And of course, D divided by two is all squared. So we get pi d squared divided by four because two squared is four okay so there we go this is the uh area of a circle using its diameter instead of radius now let's compare the light gathering powers of two telescopes and so to to compare the relative light gathering power of two telescopes we take the ratio of their diameters and it can be calculated by this little equation here. So this is actually a ratio. So instead of A, we have like the area of telescope A or the light gathering power of telescope A and divide that by the area or light gathering power of telescope B. So what happens is the pi's and the fours cancel out and we're left with the two different diameters. So we have the diameter of telescope A divided by the diameter of telescope B and all that is squared. So let's do an example. So for example, how much more light will a 10 meter telescope among the world's largest, we're talking about you know, the famed Keck telescopes in Hawaii here, how much more uh, will they collect than a 10 inch or quarter meter telescope because our units have to be the same. We can't mix meters and inches. They just don't mix together. So we're going to convert 10 inches to meters because, you know, 10 meters, it's like, what, 300 inches, but who cares? So we'll do uh, 10 meters and a quarter meter there. So what we have is 10 meters divided by one quarter meter or one fourth. 
And of course, the units cancel. We lose the meters because we're just doing a ratio. And we basically have uh, uh, one quarter here. And so that becomes four times 10, which is 40. And 40 squared is 1,600. So a 10-meter telescope will collect 1,600 times more light than a common amateur 10-inch telescope. That's why professional astronomers want their telescopes big, because the bigger the mirror or lens, the brighter things will become. Another very important term is angular resolution, also known as resolving power. And this is the ability of a telescope to reveal fine detail. And angular resolution, alpha in arc seconds, if you don't remember, you know, arc minutes, arc seconds, and degrees, just go back to part two, that equals 11.6 divided by the telescope's diameter in centimeters. And we get this little equation here. Now, if you're curious, if you're the curious type and want to know everything here, uh, this equation here for angular resolution is called Dawes limit, D-A-W-E-S. And it was named after the English astronomer, uh, W.R. Dawes, who came up with this. And it basically describes the finest detail that can be observed through a telescope under ideal seeing conditions. And you might wonder what it's seeing, but we'll... We'll get to that. And so we use 11.6 when the diameter is in centimeters. If you want to use inches, then you replace 11.6 with 4.56. And you might wonder where these numbers come from in the first place. Uh, they are not numbers like, say, the speed of light. You know, they're not, you know, uh, measured or derived, uh, but they're determined empirically uh, by actual field testing. Um, that was done. And so W.R. Dawes, or William Rudder Dawes, as his full name is, uh, he observed many, many double stars uh, at various separations. And so uh, this is based on basically hundreds of field tests of many and varied separation of double stars. So, uh, you know, it's something he determined uh, observationally in the field. So it's not something you can put pen to paper and derive or something like that. Okay, so anyway, for example, what is the angular resolution of a 10 inch, or in this case, 25 centimeter telescope? Gosh, I love the metric system. You know, 10 inches is equivalent to 25 centimeters, which is one quarter or 0.25 meters. It's, the metric system is such a joy to use. I don't, I don't know why we use the system we do in the US, it's stupid. But, but anyway, I digress. So we have 11.6 divided by 25 centimeters, and that gives us 0 0.46 arc seconds. And remember, for, for reference here, going back to part two, one arc second is equal to 1 hundredth of a degree. And one degree is your pinky, the width of your pinky finger, you know, the short width, at arm's length. So that's a very, very fine uh, amount of resolution. And that sounds pretty good, right? But, you know, uh, there are uh, certain things that get in the way. But before that, you might wonder, well, what limits the resolution of a telescope, you know? And the answer is something called the, the diffraction fringe. And so the diffraction fringe is a blurred fringe that surrounds any image, and it's caused by the wave properties of light itself. So you might know if you've ever had, you know, science or especially a physics class, that light can be treated as either a wave or a particle, but for astronomy, it's really only relevant to talk about it as a wave. So, so that's the only way I'm going to talk about it today. And um, so when light passes through uh, your telescope, you get maybe a nice image like this. This is called a, an airy disk or you know, a diffraction fringe. And this is basically a sign of perfect optics. If you see something like this, you'll have the star here and you'll get these little funky concentric rings around it. And hopefully they're nice and evenly spaced. And that tells you your telescope is uh, very optically sound and well uh, aligned. Um, I've seen this with refractors I've owned. 
Uh, but with the conditions we have around here in Michigan, I've never seen it with reflecting telescopes. But basically, it's this airy disk, the diffraction fringe, uh, that limits the resolution of any given telescope. But what you can do, of course, is get a bigger telescope because the larger the aperture, you know, the bigger this number, the smaller this becomes. So uh, aperture has two advantages. Things are brighter and things are sharper. You collect more light and your resolving power is greater. But what really limits the angular resolution of your telescope is something called seeing. And seeing are basically the atmospheric conditions on a given night. So if you're out at a observing session or star party with other amateur astronomers and you hear someone say, oh, the scene is terrible tonight, uh, they're referring to the atmospheric stability. And so uh, the scene is said to be poor when the atmosphere is unsteady, producing blurred images. Now, during the summer, we've all been out in like a parking lot of like a shopping mall or something like that. And you may have looked over like the roof of a car and you see, you know, basically heat rippling upward and how it distorts your view uh, of beyond. So what happens in the sky above is very similar, but not nearly as severe as looking over the roof of your car. So light from Jupiter, say, is nice and steady uh, during its long journey here to Earth. You know, it travels... Uh, by like four astronomical units, four times the distance between Earth and the sun to get here. And all that way, its light is nice and straight, true and steady. But that last short trip through the atmosphere causes it to get bent and distorted. And it ripples like this. Now here is actually a pretty decent night of seeing. Sometimes the scene is so bad, the image gets you know, really distorted here, and you can hardly tell what it is. But when you see Jupiter do the hula like this, it's not caused by Jupiter itself. It's basically the light from Jupiter being bent and distorted by our atmosphere. And so, of course, what can limit your scene is temperature fluctuations between day and night especially during the winter. Your telescope may be inside all day where it's 70 degrees, and then you take it outside where maybe it's 30 degrees. And so your telescope can actually give off heat and distort the views through your telescope. So that's why it's important to set up your telescope ahead of time and allow it to reach thermal equilibrium. You know, let your telescope basically cool off so you're not seeing bad seeing in your own telescope. But of course, uh, the ground itself may give off heat during the night that it collects during the day, not so much in the winter, but definitely in the summer, and uh, that can distort your scene. Or what else can distort your scene is something called the jet stream, which we've all heard of. The jet stream is created by the convergence of cold air masses descending from Arctic regions and rising warm air from the tropics. So. It's you know basically really cold up here, really hot down here. Uh, the warm and cool air converges and gives us this kind of river of turbulent air called the jet stream. Now, quite often, this jet stream passes right over us here in Michigan, and we often have bad seeing here. So a good place to live or go is, like, say, Florida, for example, because they basically have, like, 70-degree water with 70-degree air passing over 70-degree land, and the scene is really good down there. I've experienced really good scene at the Winter Star Party in the Florida Keys and have been able to observe, you know, like Saturn at really high power which is great. I've only been able to do that, you know, a handful of times in Michigan because, you know, we have big fluctuations between day and nighttime temperatures and the jet stream often passes overhead. So that's why many amateurs call a latitude of 40 degrees the roaring 40s because of the turbulent scene we often get. Now, another term related to scene is transparency. And transparency refers to the clarity of the sky. The more transparent the sky, the more stars you can see. So, of course, what can limit transparency are, of course, clouds. They can really cut transparency down to zero. But even, you know, uh, lesser 
degrees of uh, moisture, you know, humidity can lessen transparency. You know, in Michigan, it can get pretty humid in the summer, and that can really wreak havoc on our transparency. And you can have, you know, maybe uh, smoke, you know, because of climate change, uh, fire, uh, uh, wildfires out west are much more common now. And so every summer uh, now, it seems we get smoke, even in Michigan, that limits the transparency. So, uh, you know, uh, humidity or, you know, fog or haze and smoke uh, can really limit uh, transparency. So for those of you that live at high altitude, you're much better off because if you live at a high elevation, not near sea level, number one, you're above more of, you know, more of the atmosphere where, where the sky's thinner. So there's less air to dim starlight and there's less air to be distorted for seeing. So that's why astronomers build their professional telescopes on mountaintops because the transparency and the seeing are far superior than what you can have at sea level. Okay, back to the telescope terms. A after aperture, the next important term is focal length. And I'll just read it straight here. So the focal length is the distance usually given in millimeters for amateur telescopes in an optical system from the lens or primary mirror to the point where the telescope is in focus called the focal point. Or in short, it is the distance light travels in the telescope to come to a focus, to reach the focal point. So the longer a telescope's focal length, generally the more power it has and the larger the image, but the trade-off is the field of view is narrower. So it all depends on what you want to look at. If you're obsessed with looking at the moon, and planets and double stars, you want a longer focal length telescope. If you want to observe wide field vistas of deep sky objects, you want a short focal length telescope. So let's do another example here. Let's say we have two uh, eight inch reflectors. We, you know, both telescopes have eight inch mirrors. So their light gathering capacity is exactly the same. But one telescope has a focal length of 2,000 millimeters. And that would have twice the power and half the field of view of your 1,000 millimeter focal length telescope. OK? So if you want to observe the moon, planets, and double stars, you want that 8-inch 2,000 millimeter telescope. If you want wide field vistas of deep sky objects, you want that eight inch 1,000 millimeter focal length telescope. So there's not really one perfect telescope. Uh, many advanced amateurs like you know me, for example, have more than one. I currently have uh, four telescopes, but one's only for the sun. More on that later. All right, so this gets us into magnification. Everyone knows what this is. It's basically the ability to make an image bigger. And so here's how you find the magnification of a telescope. And out of all the equations that I will show you today, uh, this is the one you should know because I guarantee you, if, you're, if you set up your telescope at like a public event, they are going to ask you, what is the magnification of your telescope? And here's how you can calculate it. So the magnification of a telescope is equal to the telescope focal length divided by the eyepiece focal length. We'll talk about eyepieces later, but yes, eyepieces have focal lengths as well. So last time we talked about, you know, 7 by 50 or 10 by 50 binoculars. They always have a magnification of seven, or they always have a magnification of 10. But with telescopes, of course, you can interchange the eyepieces and get a whole range of magnifications. It's always good to have at least three eyepieces in your kit, you know, so, so you can get a whole range of magnifications. Low power for deep sky, a little higher power for planets. So let's do a, a sample calculation. The focal length of my first serious telescope, a 10-inch schmidt cassegrain telescope. It had a focal length of 2,500 millimeters. And let's say I want to look at the planets, and I throw in a 10-millimeter eyepiece. So what happens here is the millimeters cancel. 
So this uh, answer would be what we call in physics a dimensionless number. You know, it doesn't have any units. And we cancel a zero here, a zero here, and yep, we get 250 power. And you can see because the units cancel, uh, we, we put in the little X there. So we know it's magnification. So it magnifies 250 times, which is pretty good for Michigan because the general rule of thumb is 50 power per inch of aperture for maximum magnification. So if you have a 10 inch telescope, you shouldn't be able to use more than 500 power because as you increase the magnification, you know, things become uh, uh, fainter. And also you magnify the bad scene. So if the scene is really bad, uh, you do nothing but magnify that with really high power. But in Michigan, it's really half this. It's about 25 uh, power per inch of aperture. So with a 10 inch scope, uh, you can't really use more than 250 power around here on an average night. But you do get those rare nights where the scene is perfect and you don't want to go home because you can view like uh, Mars as big as a quarter. And that's how that whole Mars myth started, uh, where people thought Mars would be as big as the full moon because a NASA press release said Mars will appear as big as the full moon in your telescope. And people cut out the in the telescope part. And so uh, those of us that do a lot of public education have been terrorized by the Mars hoax ever since. But I digress. Now, there is also a minimum magnification. And this has to do with something called your focal ratio, which we'll get to here shortly. And basically, you multiply your focal ratio by seven. So if you have an F5 telescope, uh, you can't use uh, an eyepiece any uh, longer focal length than, say, 35 millimeters. So the limit to how high you can go is dependent on your aperture and the, you know, the scene conditions. But the limit to how low power you can go depends on the like a uh, focal length or focal ratio of your telescope. Now with magnification, we get into nonsense like this. Uh, every so often, not terribly often, but you know, once in a while, I like to go to Craigslist and see what junky telescopes that people are selling. And one day I spotted this on there and I just kind of roll the eyes in the back of my head because you don't see this too much today, but back in my day, you know, when I was a kid and just getting started back in the 70s and throughout the 80s, you, st you saw crap like this all the time where people like uh, Tasco or Bushnell uh, uh, posted this on their box that this little dinky telescope here, a 60 millimeter refractor uh, could go to 675 power. You know, sure, technically with the uh, overpowered Barlow lens that it comes with, more on those later, and the eyepiece, you might actually be able to reach this power, but will you actually be able to see anything uh, of worth through the telescope? The answer is no. Uh, so if you still see stuff like this, you know, like on Craigslist or in a yard sale, this is absolute nonsense. Uh, not even a 10 inch could really get this high, only on the absolute finest nights of seeing you might experience once a decade. So again, this has been pretty much eliminated with the telescopes you find in department stores today, but still just insane. Okay, so I mentioned focal ratio. So it's quite simply the ratio of a telescope's focal length to its aperture. So to calculate it, you divide the focal length by the aperture. So for example, you have that 10 inch Schmidt Cassegrain, which has a 2,500 millimeter focal length and an aperture of 10 inches or 25 centimeters or 250 millimeters. Again, I love the metric system. Our system in the US stinks, I hate it. So you basically do 2,500 divided by 250 and that gives you 10. So this is specified as F10. Now. This is really only important for astrophotography, but for visual use, referring to your focal ratio is just a really shorthand to talk about the uh, uh, focal length of your telescope. So you might hear someone say, yeah, I have a 10 inch F10. And someone might say, oh, I have a 10 inch F5. So of course the 10 inch F5 
has a shorter focal length than a 10 inch F10. But for astrophotography, a F5 would be faster than an F10. You know, it would re record light faster than an F10 because of a larger light cone. But it's not really important for visual use. I mean, it is, but in a way it isn't. Okay, so now finally with the terms out of the way, let's talk about the types of telescopes. Probably when you think of the word telescope in your head, this is the type of telescope you're thinking about. The refracting telescope or for short, a refractor. So this of course was the first type of telescope to be developed. We're not really sure who invented the telescope, but most credit goes to a, a, a Dutchman, a German Dutchman named Hans Lipperhey, uh, who in 1608 tried to uh, obtain a patent for the telescope, but his patent was rejected because other people, you know, showed them similar designs before. Uh, but because he was the first to apply for a patent, he often gets credit, but because his patent was rejected, that means people were using kind of toy telescopes, you know, just for fun before that. And so when he filed his patent on October 2nd, 1608, he says it was for an instrument used for seeing things far away as if they were nearby. And so that's, that's basically the definition of a telescope. And so Hans Lipperhey uh, was uh, a spectacle maker and the speckle industry started in Venice and Florence in the 13th century. So we've been using lenses, you know, since at least, you know, the 13th century. And the term telescope was coined by Giovanni de Minasani in 1611. So he's credited with developing the word telescope. And it basically means to see, you know, things far away, you know, up close. But I've always kind of liked the term that Thomas Harriet came up with. Thomas Harriet was kind of like the Galileo of England. He, he did ob many observations uh, before Galileo, but Galileo published his observations first. Thomas Harriet called the telescope a perspective tube. And I've always liked that term. So uh, from here on out, I will refer to it as a perspective tube. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, I, I digress here again. Here is the refracting telescope. And we always say it has a lens, but really uh, it has an ob objective lenses because you never have uh, just one lens up front. You have at least two. Some have as many as five, uh, or at least four up here, maybe one back here. But, you know, uh, refracting telescopes today have, you know, two or more lenses. And quite simply, the light comes straight in, and it's bent or refracted by the lenses. So that's why it's called the refractor, because refract means to bend, and the lens bends light. So here are some typical amateur astronomer telescopes. And remember, we always refer to telescopes by their aperture. So this, for example, is a 76 millimeter refractor. So it has a lens almost three inches in diameter. And this might be a six inch refractor, which has a lens six inches across or 150 millimeters. And then, uh, you can see they have different focal lengths. You know, this little Teleview here, uh, Teleview 76, this one's very short. So this has a short focal length. And so this is meant for more wide field views. But this long one here, or maybe even this one here, this one would be better for planets than this little guy here because it has a longer focal length because you can tell that by the length of the tube. So the longer the tube, the longer the focal length, the better they are for planets. So you know, refractors uh, aren't just for one thing. For short ones, they're for wide field vistas of deep sky objects. Longer ones are, you know, maybe more for planets, uh, but they can do pretty well on deep sky objects as well. So let's talk about the pros of a refracting telescope. First, they are the easiest to use and reliable due to the simplicity of the design. You know, basically you take them out of the box and they're ready to go, no uh, special alignment uh, needed. So that means there's very little or no maintenance. You know, if you're uh, 
objective lens up front gets uh, pretty dirty, you know, from dew, many dewy nights. Uh, you might have to clean it once in a while, uh, but not too often. But the objective lens is permanently mounted and aligned. If your objective lenses do need alignment or collimation, uh, you might have to send it in to the manufacturer. And the sealed optical tube reduces image degrading air currents and protects the optics, at least inside. The, the side of the optics that are exposed to the sky, again, might uh, need the occasional cleaning, but otherwise, uh, they are uh, very low maintenance telescopes. And you have a clear lens up front. So refractors are really known for their high contrast images because they have no central obstruction. And you might wonder, well, why would a telescope have an obstruction? And we'll get to that when we get to the next type of telescope. So because they, they are known for high contrast images, especially in longer focal lengths or larger F ratios, they are excellent for a lunar, planetary and binary star observing, especially in larger apertures. So if you're obsessed with the moon and planets and double stars, you want to get yourself a pretty decent aperture focal length refractor, but maybe not. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. And the color correction is good in the achromatic design and excellent in high-end Apple chromatic designs. So yeah, there are different types of refractors. They seem so simple. You know, you basically have a couple of lenses up front, but those lenses can be different. Now, an achromat is the lesser design. And uh, they were developed around the 19th century, the mid 19th century or so. And they basically have a, a concave flint glass and convex crown glass, but they uh, are not perfect. And, and we'll, we'll come back to that. But high-end apochromatic refractors, they use more exotic types of glass like ED glass or extra low dispersion glass, ED extra low dispersion, fluorite, you know, stuff like that. So uh, they're of course much more expensive too. And, um, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to all that. And refractors are good for uh, distant terrestrial viewing. In fact, many refractors and like, you know, sporting shops are sold as spotting scopes. Now, a dedicated spotting scope might not be great for astronomy, uh, but you know many small refractors meant for astronomy can be good spotting scopes as well. You just have to buy an extra accessory called a 45 degree diagonal, but I'll come back to diagonals later as well. So these are the pros of your refracting telescope. Now let's look at the cons. They are the more expensive per inch of aperture, especially for the apochromatic refractors because they use such expensive exotic types of glass. So the cost and bulk factors limit the practical usefulness, uh, uh, the useful maximum size of the objective to smaller apertures. So today you really can't buy a larger refractor than a six inch. They are available from roughly 50 millimeters to you know six inches, you know, roughly two inches to six inches. So if you're really obsessed with observing the faint fuzzies, you know, faint deep sky objects, especially galaxies, a refractor is not for you. You want something you can get in a larger aperture. But again, Refractors are great for wide field views of deep sky objects, and especially shorter focal lengths, but good for longer focal lengths with the planets, and still really good for deep sky objects too. And uh, they're heavier, longer, and bulkier than equivalent aperture reflecting telescopes because light comes straight in the uh, tube basically with just a little bit of bending from the lens up front. So. A six inch you know, refractor can get pretty long. It's still pretty portable, but when you get uh, to seven inches or eight inches, uh, they just get so long, uh, they become really expensive and difficult to transport. You know, a, a 10 inch refractor would need a pretty large dome uh, to be housed in. You just, you can't transport a 10 inch 
refractor, plus they're uh, ungodly expensive. And as mentioned, uh, they are difficult to collimate. If the optics are knocked out of alignment, if you somehow drop it or you're on a really bumpy road out in the middle of nowhere, uh, you might have to send it in. Some refractors can be collimated on their own uh, by the user, but odds are you'll have to send it in, which is uh, uh, quite expensive. And the acromatic designs that use the crown and flint glass, they have color aberrations. And that's what we'll get into now. So the, these color aberrations are called chromatic aberration. And only achromatic refractors suffer from this. You know, maybe to a degree lesser apochromatic refractors do, but it's pretty much been eliminated in higher end apochromatic refractors, at least at visual wavelengths. So here we have a single lens, which uh, no refractor is, but this is just for an example. So what's going to happen here is the white light comes in. And we all know white light is made up of different colors. You know, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. There is no indigo, by the way. That's a whole other story. Uh, so red light is longer focal length than green or blue light. So long focal length, intermediate focal length, sh uh, short focal length. And so because of the different focal lengths, they're bent or refracted at different angles, and you'll have red light come to a focus here, green here, and blue here. Now, uh, what this looks like is maybe something like this, uh, but not quite. Uh, it's even worse in, uh, with a single lens here. This is with uh, this is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy with a uh, achromatic refractor. Now, achromatic refractors use two different types of glass, as mentioned. They use crown glass and flint glass because they focus the light differently. So with the two lenses together, they bring uh, basically red and green light together, but not really so much the blue light. So when you look through an achromatic refractor or take pictures with it, you get these little kind of purplish or blue halos around them. And the overall symptom of this is called chromatic aberration again. But when you see the purple glow, this is called a secondary spectrum. Now, there are uh, filters you can screw on your eyepiece called like minus violet filters that can obscure this. But that's all they do is they hide it. What's happening is the three main colors, you know, red, uh, green, and blue, are not coming to the same focus. So it degrades the image a little bit. And no filter can correct for that. The way to correct for that is to get yourself an apochromatic refractor because they focus all the colors at one point. But it's expensive to do that. So for visual use, it's not too bad. But if you do compare an achromatic refractor to an apochromatic refractor, I mean, there's just no comparison. You know, apochromatic refractors are like the, the Lamborghinis or the Ferraris of refractors. They are spectacular. So if you can afford an apochromatic refractor, go ahead and get one. But they are really expensive. Now let's get into uh, probably the most common type of amateur telescope, the reflecting telescope. The specific ones shown here, because there are lots of different types of reflecting telescopes, uh, is a Newtonian reflector. And yes, Isaac Newton, the Isaac Newton, built the first practical reflecting telescope in 1668, which still exists to this day. I would love to see it one day. So um, he basically used, you know, mirrors, but his his. his his first mirrors and the first mirrors were made of uh, speculum, an alloy of tin and copper. But today, uh, mirrors are coated with like aluminum or, or silver, if you can find that. The silver is better, but no one really does that much anymore, unless you special order it. So in this case, the light comes straight in, all down the tube. There's no lens up front to bend the light. In fact, the only lenses are in the eyepiece. So the light comes straight in, and because we have a concave parabolic primary mirror, it has a bit of curve to it, 
the light is reflected in a cone to a flat secondary mirror at a 45 degree angle. And that goes up into the eyepiece where you view it with your eye. So instead of viewing through the back, you view through the side of the telescope. So it's a very simple design still, but a little more complex than a refractor. So here are some uh, various amateur Newtonian reflector telescopes. It's basically the only type of straight reflector I'm gonna talk about. And again, you can see they come in a variety of apertures and focal lengths. Here's a small aperture, short focal length telescope. I have one very much like this, but uh, I use it for tabletop displays at uh, uh, public outreach events. And you can see, you know, some are still very short, but they're longer focal length than they look because, again, the light goes down, back up, and up, 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 up through here. So the light travels a little further than it would in a refractor of this length. And you can see they got various, you know, apertures, again, and various focal lengths. So this would be like a, a wide field reflector, great for visual use and astrophotography. And this one uh, is a bit longer focal length and uh, is... Uh, for closer views of deep sky objects, but would do pretty good on the planets too. This is from Parks Optical, by the way, which I uh, believe is now out of business, unfortunately. And here's the famous uh, Astro Scan from Edmund Scientific. Those are fun little telescopes as well. So let's get into the pros of a Newtonian reflector. So I am specifically talking about a Newtonian reflector here. The first pro is with your pocketbook. They are the lowest cost per inch of aperture, the exact opposite of a refractor because Newtonians are by far the easiest type of telescope to make. That's why many, you know, manufacturer, many telescope manufacturers make Newtonian reflectors because they can make a lot of profit because they're cheap to make and you can, you know, bump up the price a little bit. In fact, they're so easy to make Many amateurs still prefer to build their own. They grind their own mirrors. They construct their own telescopes. That used to be a necessity up till the 1960s or so. But after uh, cheap imports and stuff like that, uh, and the price of telescopes has gone down, you know, most people buy their telescopes today as opposed to building them. But before the 70s, uh, pretty much everyone built their telescopes because it was far cheaper to do so. So because Newtonian reflectors are the cheapest per inch of aperture, they are available in a wide range of apertures. So if you are obsessed with the faint fuzzies, you want to observe, you know, faint nebulae, star clusters, and galaxies, or you want to really bring out the brighter nebulae, star clusters, and galaxies, you want to get yourself a Newtonian reflector because you can buy a big one for a relatively low price. I mean, yeah, the really big ones are still expensive, but relatively speaking, compared to a refractor, they're dirt cheap. So yeah, they are available in a huge range of apertures. I think the smallest reflector is that little tabletop telescope I mentioned. That's about 70 millimeters. And the largest you can get is about 32 inches big. And they are low in optical aberrations and deliver very bright images because you can buy them in large apertures. So they have no chromatic aberration because there's no lenses the light passes through except for the eyepiece. And that doesn't really give you any uh, color unless it's a really old, uh, uh, low quality eyepiece, which you don't see anymore. They do suffer uh, from coma or maybe a little spherical aberration, uh, but that can be easily corrected out. Well, at least the coma can, not so much the spherical aberration, you know, hence the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> so uh, the longer focal lengths, like say an F7, are reasonably good for lunar and planetary work. So if you do have a longer focal length, you know, uh, reflector, you know, it is good for the moon and planets, so they can do a little bit of everything. But your shorter focal length ones are the ones that are really good uh, for deep sky viewing, and that's what that's what most reflectors are sold for, for viewing deep sky objects. And because they're, you know, shorter than your 
equivalent aperture refractor. They're reasonably compact and portable up to focal lengths of about 1,000 millimeters. As you get to 10 inches or bigger, they can become very difficult to transport, but there are ways around that, and we'll see some examples of that here shortly. And the really higher end models are excellent for deep sky astrophotography. So we will save that more for part five next time. Now here are the cons. They are not suited for terrestrial applications because all Newtonian reflectors show you images that are upside down. Now many people hate that, but the only thing you really notice it on, at least up in the sky, is the moon. Otherwise you don't notice. So the, the basic advice I can give you is get over it. You know, for nebulae, star clusters, and galaxies, you'll never notice that the image is upside down. You can correct for that, but it degrades the image. So why do that? Why not just view it upside down? As we always say, you know, there is no upside down in space, so it doesn't matter. But you just can't use them during the day to look at wildlife. You want to get a refractor or the next type of telescope to do that. And of course, the open optical tube design allows image degrading air currents and air contaminants. You know, every so often you'll have to take out your primary mirror and clean it. And that can scare beginners. You know, I don't enjoy doing it myself. The best bit of advice for cleaning your optics is don't do it unless you desperately need to. I mean, if it's really bad, you have to. And if you use your reflector a lot and it gets dewy a lot, you might have to send in a mirror for re-illumination or <laughs> re-illuminization every so often. That's easy for me to say. Uh, there are places you can send in your mirror to get it recoded, but you shouldn't have to do that every so often. And if you take really good care of your reflector, make sure it never gets due, keep the optics covered up when not in use, you might not ever have to send it in to get it re-illuminized. And because of that secondary mirror, you know, that does block some of the light that comes into the telescope. So there is a slight light loss due to the secondary mirror. So if you compare a six inch reflector with a six inch refractor, the images to the refractor will always be brighter and sharper than the reflector because again, that secondary mirror blocks some of the light and it reduces contrast. But you save a lot of money for the reflector compared to the refractor. And here's the one that really uh, scares many amateurs away or many beginners away from a reflector is they require frequent collimation. Basically, uh, if you have a six inch or larger, you basically have to collimate it every time you take it out. If you want you know, your violin, or your piano to play properly, you get it tuned. If you want your telescope to perform properly in the field, you want to make sure it's aligned properly, or as we say, collimated. The secondary and primary mirror must be in alignment. And that frightens many beginners. You can collimate your mirror mirrors with a star, but there are uh, uh, Cheshire eyepieces and laser collimators that make it easy to do before it gets dark. I get into that a little more with astrophotography, but not, not too much here. Uh, faster reflectors like a F4 uh, can suffer from what's called off-axis coma, where the stars look like little comets near the edge of the field of view. But the really good part is, is that's very easy to correct for. There are devices called coma correctors that can fix that. Teleview Optics has one called Paracor, and Battered Planetarium has one. I think they just call it the coma corrector. Uh, but, you know, uh, the, there are devices you can buy to, to correct for coma. That's really a necessity for astrophotography. And, you know, it's nice for visual use, too, to get, you know, stars very sharp to the edge of the field of view. And, of course, large apertures over eight inches can be very, you know, bulky, heavy, and tend to be, you know, fairly expensive. But there are ways you can get around that. And, and again, we're, we're getting to that.
you, you can make a big reflector that's very portable. The third type of telescope is a catadioptric telescope or a compound telescope. The most common type of catadioptric is the schmidt cassegrain which is shown here. Another very popular design is a Maksudov cassegrain. So in the schmidt cassegrain light travels, you know, nice and straight until it hits this thin, slightly aspheric Schmidt correcting lens. It's so thin, we call it a corrector plate instead of a correcting lens because, again, it's so skinny. So when the light comes in, it's slightly bent, like with a refractor. Um, and then it, it goes off, reflects off the spherical primary mirror up to the secondary mirror, down through a hole in the center of the primary to your eye or via a diagonal, which you would have back here. So you might wonder or say, you know, there's a hole in the middle of the primary mirror, you know, yeah, why not? Because it's in the shadow of the secondary mirror anyway. So why not put a hole here? No direct light comes here anyway. And the really great thing about catadioptric telescopes, or especially Schmidt Cassegrains and even Maksudov Cassegrains, is they are very compact and very portable. And that's why these became very popular uh, starting in the early 1960s when Tom Johnson at Celestron uh, marketed the first uh, Schmidt Cassegrains. And of course, uh, Celestron built their fortune, at least originally, with the C8, which had orange tube kind of like this one because you know i uh, i think the orange tube came about in the 1970s i think the first ones in the 60s probably had a white tube uh but you know orange was kind of the the color of the 70s for some reason and so you can see many celestrons older celestron schmitts that have orange tube like this so here's a collection of schmidt cassegrains and you can see uh the orange one of course and these two are from celestron and these are from mead or also orion today because Orion now owns Mead Instruments, so they're kind of one and the same now. And uh, here with this uh, Mead, you can really see the uh, corrector plate here, and you can see it's kind of purple because it has uh, coatings to make the uh, uh, correcting plate much more transparent to light because you don't want the corrector plate to reflect light away. You want light to pass through. And you can see they're all, re again, really short. And they really look like light buckets because they, they basically do have the, kind of a bucket tube. And they were made like this because they're extremely portable. But I'm jumping ahead here. So here are some Maksudov Cassegrains. Now, I give you uh, all the great benefits of your longer focal length refractor. I mentioned how they are great for the moon and double stars and planets, but of course, the apochromatic designs are really expensive. But if you want to try to save some money and observe the moon, planets, and double stars, get yourself a Maksudov Cassegrain. Now, years ago, I compared a 7-inch Maksudov Cassegrain from Mead, which they don't make anymore, with an astrophysics refractor, a very high-end refractor, and the Mac, which is what we call Maksudov Cassegrains for short, uh, really performed, you know, almost as well as the astrophysics. I mean, so Macs are really great for color correction and contrast. They are just really, really excellent for that. So we have the famous Questar here which, you know, cost thousands of dollars even in the 1970s, and they cost many more thousands today, but they are beautiful, uh, beautifully constructed. They are just gorgeous telescopes. But you have smaller ones here from Orion that make great spotting scopes. You can see the 45-degree diagonal here. So, so it's sold as a spotting scope. And both Ioptron and Mead here have 6-inch Macs that are pretty good. I don't know of anyone that makes a 7-inch, but if you can find that Mead 7-inch on the used market, I would get it. And these came about, by the way, uh, after they were invented by Dmitry Maksudov in 1944. And instead of a corrector plate, they use a deeply curved, you know, full diameter negative meniscus lens called a correcting lens. So because it's much thicker, 
it's referred to as a correcting lens as opposed to a corrector plate. And they are, again, great for spotting scopes or uh, nighttime use with the planets or, you know, higher resolution with deep sky objects like planetary nebulae. So here are the pros. They are considered by some to be the best all around, all purpose telescope design. You know, uh, they do give excellent uh, views. You know, they have excellent optics with razor sharp images over a wide field, especially the newer ones made today that are coma free because they have a little coma corrector in the back. Uh, they do planets really well. Just as not as well as a Maksudov Cassegrain or a well made uh, refractor. They do deep sky objects pretty well. This is not as well as a good reflector. So they're kind of the uh, all-purpose telescope. They're not the best for any specific application, but they're pretty good. Uh, and so, you know, they, they're good for lunar, planetary, and binary star observing. This is not as good as a Mac or a well-made refractor, especially your uh, uh, Apple chromatic refractor. And they are really, really good for deep sky observing or astrophotography, just as not as well as a well-made reflector. Uh, they do have closed uh, tubes, which reduce image degrading air currents on the inside. Uh, if you get gunk on the inside of your telescope, that means you're not treating it very well. You know, you should always keep the back end of your Schmidt like this is a schmidt cassegrain range showed here, when not in use, you should always have a little cap on the back. And because of the correcting plate up front, you know, you, you never get anything inside. So it stays nice and clean. Now, the outside of the corrector plate, that's a different uh, uh, matter, but uh, we'll, 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 we'll come back to that. And the, the whole reason that schmidt cassegrains exist is they are extremely compact and portable. Because today, the term backyard astronomer is kind of an oxymoron because many of us cannot observe in our backyard because we live in light polluted areas. So many of us have to travel, you know, maybe a half hour or as many as three hours if you live near a big city to get to relatively dark skies. And, you know, today we have smaller cars because gas prices are high. And so you might want a telescope that's very portable. And that's where a Schmidt Cassegrain comes into play because you can get a big one that's really, really portable. They are, they are also very durable and virtually maintenance free. Uh, they hold collimation very well. You might not have to collimate it every time you take it out, but, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to check every time you take it out, but they do hold collimation pretty well. And, you know, every once in a while, every couple of years, you might have to clean the, the front of the corrector plate if you get dew on it, but you can avoid that. Now, here are the cons. They are more expensive than Newtonian reflectors of equal aperture because they are a lot more complex to build than a equivalent Newtonian reflector. So you'll pay more for a 10-inch Schmidt Cassegrain than you would a 10-inch Newtonian reflector. There is a slight light loss due to the secondary mirror obstruction. It's a little bit worse than with your Newtonian reflector, at least for the most part, because the secondary mirror is a bit larger than your typical Newtonian. They do take longer for the optics to reach thermal equilibrium when you take them outside. So it's always good to set up your telescope at least 30 minutes in advance to let it cool off. So because they got more glass, they take a little longer to cool off than your typical Newtonian or smaller refractor. And probably the biggest drawback, especially with larger apertures, is the way they focus is there's a little focus knob in the back and as you turn the focus knob, it moves the primary mirror, you know, like a little up and a little bit back. And uh, with, with larger mirrors, the, the mirror shifts a bit when you're focusing. So you're looking through the eyepiece here, you're trying to focus, but the image is jumping around on you a little bit. Now, my club used to have a 12-inch uh, Schmidt, uh, Schmidt Cassegrain in our observatory. And that had the worst case of image shift I have ever seen. You know, the, it, it would jump all over the place. And when you did get it in focus, the mirror would like slip back a little bit and lose focus. So you'd have to adjust the focus again, and then, then it would shift around a little bit. There are ways you can get around that, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But 
it's a big problem with Schmidt Cassegrains, and that's image focus. It's better than it used to be, uh, but still, pretty much every Schmidt is going to have some kind of image shift. Even Maxudov Cassegrains will suffer from this if you use your standard uh, little knob focuser. Uh, pretty much all Schmidt Cassegrains are F10 except for the ones uh, meant specifically for astrophotography. Mead has some, for example, that are uh, F8 that are used for taking pictures with, but they pretty much all have a narrow field of view compared to faster Newtonians because most Newtonians are between F4 and F8. And the larger apertures, 10 inches and up, are pretty heavy. I could handle my 10 inch on a fork mount because, you know, and, and that weighed about 60 pounds, but uh, I could handle that. I still could. 12 inches gets a little difficult to carry, at least if it's on a fork mount. Uh, the optical, optical tube by itself isn't too bad, but anything bigger than 12 inches with just the optical tube, you know, like a 14 or 16 inch Schmidt, you, you need help uh, from someone to set it up. Or you put it in a observatory where you don't have to worry about stuff like that. Your telescope, no matter how good it is, is nothing without a good telescope mount. So the first type of mount we'll talk about for telescopes is a good old German equatorial mount. So here we have a nice uh, Celestron. This looks like a Celestron nine and a quarter inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain, but that's not really relevant. And you can see uh, we have a counterweight on the opposite side here. So there's the counterweight. You might need more than one though for a scope this big, but you always have at least one or more counterweights here on the counterweight shaft to uh, balance off uh, the telescope. And you can see uh, this as the declination axis. And then the, the way I can't move it is the right ascension axis. So remember right ascension and declination is uh, longitude and latitude for the sky. You know. Every city has a longitude and latitude. Every deep sky object has a specific right ascension and declination. So you can see we have the polar axis here. And this part points up toward the North Celestial Pole near Polaris. And you can see the whole contraption here is at a bit of an angle. So imagine we have the horizon here. And the, the angle the telescope is at depends on your latitude. So you set the uh, angle of the uh, telescope here. You can see there's like a little readout here you can barely see. You just put in your latitude. You know, if you live at a latitude of 42 degrees, like we do here in Kalamazoo, you have your uh, mount angled at 42 degrees and place it so this end points toward the North Star. And that's how you properly align a German equatorial mount. Now, for visual use, it's not really critical, but if you get into astrophotography, you really want to learn how to uh, align your German equatorial mount. You can start doing that on your own at first, and you know it doesn't hurt to learn how to do it that way. But there are plenty of uh, you know computer programs that can help you uh, polar align your telescope. But I won't get into that. For visual use, you just kind of roughly point it toward the North Star, and that's more or less good enough. Maybe a little better than that if you have a computerized telescope, but it's not super critical. So that's why I love love it when I see images like this. I got this from uh, Terrence Dickinson, you know, the author of Nightwatch, uh, some time ago, over 10 years ago, when he gave a talk for us. And uh, he he pulled this out of a uh, like shopper for Sears or something like that. And my goodness, uh, this 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 telescope is just really messed up. Uh, so hopefully by now you can realize uh, the, the equatorial mount here is set for the equator. Uh, you know maybe they do live on the equator, but you know I sort of doubt it. So the, the mount is uh, uh, not angled properly. It's, it's not set for a typical latitude where you would find a Sears anyway. Um, the uh, telescope is pointed toward the ground because of course the light comes in here off the primary up the secondary and this is where you view through it. And they have the finder scope on backwards and they're looking through the finder scope, which I guess fine by itself, but uh, they're looking through it in the wrong direction. But the thing that always bothered me is or uh, surprised me 
is I never knew Mitt Romney sold telescopes. <laughs> uh, so, so here's uh, probably the most uh, easiest mount for an amateur to use, one that's getting started, or, you know, for just casual observing too, is your good old all azimuth mount. Because they're very simple. They're called all azimuth mounts because they only move in altitude, you know, up and down, or azimuth, you know, in different directions in the sky. So basically they move, you know, up, down, left, right. Very intuitive, very simple for the beginner because with your German equatorial mount, because the whole telescope is at an angle, it's not quite intuitive how to move it and point it at different parts of the sky. So for if you're really just a visual observer, uh, then you might want to get yourself a really nice all azimuth mount. And they got quite a few today. Uh, back when I first started, you know, you really couldn't find any good all azimuth mounts. Uh, but today they are plentifully uh, available. And, you know, some are really hefty. There's one like this from Lost Mandy. You can even see it has uh, uh, dual mounts here. So you could put two different telescopes on it. Uh, and, and that's the same with this one here. You can have a refractor on one side, and maybe a uh, Schmidt Cassegrain on the other side. You know, why not? Why not have two telescopes together? Of course, it costs more that way, but there you go. And, uh, you know, most only hold one, though. Here's a nice manual one. I, I forget who makes this one, but this is a very nice looking all azimuth mount. And of course, some are even computerized. Uh, this is a really small one here from Skywatcher. You can buy a keypad for it, but it's mainly meant to be controlled from your uh, smartphone. Has like a 40,000 object database. It's for smaller refractors, you know, ones that lay, weigh less than 11 pounds, but it's very portable. And here's a bit more robust one from Ioptron. So again, there are a wealth of all azimuth mounts available today. But probably the most famous of all the all azimuth mounts is none other than the Dobsonian mount. In fact, the mounts are so famous, many beginners think a Dobsonian telescope is a different type of telescope. But all Dobsonians are Newtonian reflectors but when they're on this rocker type box, they are known as a Dobsonian because this style of mount was invented by John Dobson, who was a uh, monk and became kind of a telescope builder. He could have made a fortune marketing this design, but he basically gave it away freely and, um, you know, became very famous because of it. So, you know, People always ask, you know, what telescope should I get? I always try to tell them, you know, the, the steps, you know, read books, learn the sky, use binoculars. But some people just want to get a telescope. So if this is you, if you're just saying, I just want to get a telescope, Richard, tell me which one to get. If you really want me to tell you, I want you to get either a six inch or eight inch Dobsonian. You cannot go wrong with a six inch or eight inch dob. These don't have the fancy go-to stuff. You could buy it, but I, I wouldn't recommend it. I would get a six inch or eight inch manual dob because they do deep sky objects really well and they do planets really well. They're very easy to set up and take down. And once you learn, they're really easy to collimate. You know, that freaks out beginners, but it's not too bad. I really like this one from Skywatcher. It has a flex tube. It basically has this, you know, collapsible tube. And that makes them very portable. Our club recently ordered one of these uh, for use uh, during our public observing sessions that we'll keep in our observatory. It's still on back order, but uh, we, we hope to get it by spring. So these are great because they're very portable. You know, the solid tubes, not so much. But you also have ones you can take apart in this truss tube design here. So we have like a couple six inches here. I think this is also a, a, a there's a six, there's an eight, this is a 10 inch, and this is a 16 inch from Mead. And yeah, the, this whole thing with the truss tubes can be taken apart and makes it very portable. So that is the great thing about Dobsonian telescopes is they make very large aperture telescopes extremely portable or, you know, <laughs> relatively speaking. So here's this taken to the extreme, at least a few examples taken to the extreme. 
these are obsession telescopes. I mean, you might be thinking, well, yeah, they got to be obsessed, right? But no, that's the name of the company called Obsession in Wisconsin. They make very good large aperture Dobsonian telescopes. And uh, this is a 20 inch and these are two 25 inches. Now there is one affliction you have to worry about if you ever look through one of these and it's called aperture fever. It is extremely contagious because when you look through one of these, especially, you know, a big 25 inch, you immediately think to yourself, I got to get me one of those. But, you know, for people like me, you know, you look at your pocketbook and say, nope, I'm too poor. So uh, the cure or kind of vaccine for aperture fever is poverty. And, uh, and I suffer from that in the extreme. <laughs> well, maybe not the extreme, uh, but I definitely can't afford one of these big guys here. But I have looked through some pretty big dobs in my day. I have looked through a 20 inch. And here's an example of what I saw. I was at the 2005 Winter Star Party in the Florida Keys, and one of our members brought his 20-inch obsession. And he said, uh, you know, Richard, come take a look at this. Because uh, he had, uh, without telling me, Omega Centauri in the eyepiece of his, you know, and the eyepiece was a 31 millimeter Nagler Type 5 with a 2X power mate. I'll talk about all those later. And so I, I look in the eyepiece and I lost control. I screamed, you know, holy, you know, with a little expletive uh, afterward. And people uh, came running and they were like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And the guy I was with, you know, with the 20-inch obsession said, oh, nothing. Richard just looked at uh, Omega Centauri in my scope. And then, of course, we had this huge line of people, you know, coming to look at Omega Centauri through his 20-inch dot because it was unreal. It was just stars from edge to edge. And this is as close as I could get to reproduce it. I didn't quite see the colors, but just from one edge to the other, it was packed with finely resolved stars. It was incredible. But you can't buy this from Obsession anymore. They don't make them this big anymore. Uh, but here's a 30 inch I saw at the 2010 Oki Tech Star Party. I never did go back to look through this one at night and I kind of wish I did. But I have looked through bigger telescopes than a 30 inch here. Here's the famous Yard Scope. This telescope is owned, I think still, by Crazy Bob Summerfield, who runs Astronomy To Go, kind of a public outreach astronomy thing in the uh, Pittsburgh area, I think, in Pennsylvania. And he's a frequent uh, uh, site at star parties like the Winter Star Party or the Texas Star Party. And here's his uh, scope at the Winter Star Party, obviously, not the Texas Star Party. But I first looked through this at the Texas Star Party in 2001. And I saw uh, the Whirlpool galaxy, and it's been hard to look at the Whirlpool ever since because it was just so alive and vivid, you know, bright and detailed through this big scope. But here again at the 2005 Winter Star Party, I looked through uh, the scope at the Horsehead Nebula, and you know, ahead of me were many you know novices. And he kept having to describe, you know, what the horse head looked like and where to look and stuff like that. Many of us have been in that same position where we have to describe, you know, the view over and over again. But I get up the ladder because he had a ladder set up and look through the eyepiece. I'm like, oh, there it is, because it was so easy to see the horse head in a scope this big. Now, here is the worst case of aperture fever I have ever seen. This gentleman here is named Mike Clements. And this is his uh, homemade 70 inch, 1.8 meter Dobsonian. And that's 70, seven zero inches. It is the world's largest backyard telescope. It was featured in National Geographic some time ago. And I'm still pretty sure it's the record holder for the world's largest amateur telescope. I mean, look at all the finder scopes on this thing. So obviously you only have you only have the setup under clear skies. 
because I would not want to have this thing set up in a lightning storm. But, you know, wh wh why would you have it out in a lightning storm anyway? But, you know, big Dobbs have one advantage that no one ever talks about. They can give you shade, too, during the day. <laughs> so I, I saw this guy at the uh, 2010 Oki Techstar party uh, using his big dob, maybe a 17 or 18 inch, you know, for shade, you know, sure, you can use that. But seriously, uh, this is what your big dobs or your big aperture telescopes are for. And so here, here it is in summary. The larger the mirror, the larger the aperture, the brighter and sharper things become. So yeah, here's the view through an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain, your classic C8, for example. And here's the view through a 25 inch obsession of the famous globular cluster M13. It is the finest globular cluster in the northern sky, but compared to Omega Centauri, you know, it's nothing. So that's why you get the biggest telescope you can afford. You know, uh, portability is a very important factor, but you want to get the, the biggest, most portable telescope you can handle. For some people, that gets really big, but not everyone can do that. So let's go through some purchasing advice. Number one, as I've been talking about over and over again, you got to educate yourself. That's why you're listening to me talk about this stuff today. Uh, so I'm helping you, you know, I'm, I'm trying to pass on a little bit of my experience to you. Um, and that's great. You know, you made an excellent choice by checking out the Introduction to Amateur Astronomy Lecture Series. But when it's over, you're going to be on your own again. So, you know, there are lots of great websites you can check out. Of course, there are many fine books uh, to, to learn the basics of this wonderful hobby. And, uh, of course, you should join your local astronomy club and attend their observing sessions. Let me back up and do that again. Join your local astronomy club and attend their observing sessions. Got it? Because I've been in an astronomy club for a long time and the usual reason that people let their membership lapse is, oh, I'm busy. I don't have time to attend your club meetings. And uh, so I've heard that I don't know how many times, but if you like astronomy, you should always support your local club because you know they do lots of outreach in the community. They might help support dark sky advocacy, and you just help their other programming, you know, with observing sessions or bring in speakers. So, if you have a local club in your area, join your local astronomy club and support them. Maybe you can't go as often as you should, but if you love astronomy, you should support it. Membership for most clubs is really cheap. And of course, if your club has one, take advantage of the club's telescope loan program. We have one. Uh, we don't have as many telescopes as we used to have. We used to have a short tube 80, but someone, someone stole it out of our coordinator's uh, garage, that's terrible, uh, which we haven't replaced, but we do have a nice uh, Celestar 8 that's available for loan. So if you live in the Kalamazoo area and you're a member of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society, you can check out a eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain, a very serious telescope. It doesn't have go-to, but it's still a really good telescope. And we do have others available for loan. One's a solar telescope, the others are big pair of binoculars and so on. Now, aside from local star parties or local observing sessions, uh, you can attend, you know, maybe larger local or state or nationwide uh, star parties, like, you know, the Texas star party, the winter star party, the Oki Tech star party. You will see every type of telescope you can imagine at one of these big star parties. It allows you to, you know, check them out, talk to the owners, and look through some big ones at night, you know, to see what they can do. And you'll get aperture fever and either spend a lot of money or cry because you're poor like me. Um, a new thing I added here is read reviews. Of course, uh, magazines like Astronomy, Sky and Telescope, Sky News, Sky at Night, they always have equipment reviews. Of course, they're kind of few and far between. They might not review the telescope you're looking at. But you can get on websites, you know, like uh, forums like Cloudy Nights. They got great forums or uh, the Stargazers Lounge. 
They've got great forums. You can look for other reviews on, you know, websites or club newsletters. Uh, so look for reviews. And of course, there's reviews on, you know, uh, websites where you buy telescopes. Read the reviews. But, you know, when it comes to reading reviews on uh, telescope dealers' websites, you know, always take them with a grain of salt because sometimes you wonder if they make those up. <laughs> and the one thing you should really remember and pass on as much as you can to other beginners is never ever buy a telescope at a department store, you know, like a, a Walmart uh, or, you know, uh, Kmart, if you can find a Kmart and so on. They are all, without exception, junk. You will throw your money away. Maybe you did buy one and you're a little offended by that. I've had people that told me that, like, you, you, you offended me, Richard. I, I bought one of these, but hey, I can talk. My first telescope was a 60 millimeter Jason ref refractor. I always tell people that's the telescope that taught me how to swear because it was so difficult to use. They are garbage. Never buy a telescope at a department store. Purchase a telescope from a reputable dealer and a knowledgeable salesperson if you can buy yours in person. But most of us will have to buy it online today because we might not have a local telescope dealer. You're very lucky if you do, because there aren't many of them around today. But if you can buy your telescope in person, I always recommend the first question you ask the salesperson is, what telescope do you own? If they don't own a telescope, don't talk to them because they have no freaking clue what they're talking about. All right, now let's transition into accessories. If you're wondering, by the way, uh, this is my telescope. This is my nine and a quarter inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain. And this is my old uh, Celestron C Gem mount, but I don't own this mount anymore. I, I sold it for Astrophysics Mach 1, a very good uh, German equatorial mount. I just, just in case you're curious. So here's the most important accessory eyepieces, also known as oculars. Some, you know, some beginners or a lot of beginners call them lenses. It's, it's not wrong, but, you know, they're either referred to as eyepieces or oculars, not like a lens because, you know, they have many lenses inside of them, at least two. And as you can see from the picture here, there are a wide assortment of lenses. Some are, you know, good quality. Some are great quality. And, of course, there are some stinkers out there. So let's talk about the basics first, and that is the barrel size. They, they of course, vary. The smallest barrel size, and I'm talking about the barrels here, like here or here, the smallest size is uh, 0 0.965 inches, just a little bit bigger than a quarter. These are what the department store telescopes come with. Even still today, I've seen department store telescopes that come with 0.965 inch eyepieces. And by and large, they are garbage. So if a telescope comes with 0.965 eyepieces, uh, don't buy it. And if you already have a telescope with small eyepieces like this, you know, uh, you can't upgrade. So uh, the most common size is inch and a quarter. And again, uh, any inch and a quarter eyepiece can work in any telescope. That's the great thing about eyepieces is they are interchangeable. You can use any manufacturer's eyepiece in any telescope out there. It's not like a Windows Mac thing where, you know, there's not really much in the way of com compatibility, but eyepieces can be used on any other telescope. It's totally fine. So the most common size is inch and a quarter. But more and more telescopes are coming with two inch eyepieces now. When I bought my new Schmidt Cassegrain, my nine and a quarter, like 10 years ago, uh, that came with a two inch eyepiece, like, like this one here. But I sold that pretty quick because I'm a Teleview guy. I love Uncle Al, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so, the, so two inches is the most common large eyepiece. I do believe it's Explore Scientific that sells a three inch eyepiece. I think they only have one. But there is at least one three-inch eyepiece out there. But a three-inch eyepiece means you have to get a three-inch diagonal. So you can do that if you want, though. 
But uh, the most common sizes are inch and a quarter and two inch with still inch and a quarter, uh, probably being far ahead of two inches. And of course, with two inches, you get really wide fields of view. So that's why somebody would bother to get a two inch eyepiece because they can be pretty expensive. So really fast here, let's go through the different types of eyepieces just to introduce you to these because you know it's called introduction to amateur astronomy. Uh, but I want you to be familiar with all the eyepiece types out there. Uh, the, the, the very first compound or multi-lens eyepiece is the Huygens eyepiece invented by Christian Huygens, the famous Dutch astronomer and scientist in the late 1600s. And they basically have two lens elements with kind of a plano convex lens and a, 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 a convex, a, a plano lens and a convex lens here. And, you know, they have very narrow fields, uh, uh, lots of distortions. Uh, they can be good for solar projection if they're good quality. For uh, kicks, I mentioned I bought a, a tabletop telescope one time for a display. That came with plastic Huygens eyepieces. So I thought I would try one for solar projection. And guess what? It, it melted. It was actually pretty cool. Uh, so, um, you know, that's okay for an experienced person like me, but uh, make sure your uh, eyepiece isn't all plastic if you want to try to use it for solar projection. But it was pretty cool to watch an eyepiece melt. Uh, so basically, if you have a Huygens eyepiece, and you can tell if you do because it'll have a little H on it, uh, you want to replace it. There, you know, it's you know 360 years old. We've obviously came up with better stuff since then. Um, the Ramsden eyepiece came about in 1782 by Jesse Ramsden, and it's basically just a Huygens eyepiece with the field lens here uh, flipped. So, so you can I can go back and forth here, and you can see it's pretty much the same. It's just that this lens has been flipped over. Uh, they basically, uh, it's basically no major improvement over the Huygens eyepiece. So if you have a, you know, a R next to it or an SR, that's a Ramsden eyepiece and you want to replace that as well. Now, back in the uh, 1980s and even up into the 1990s, I would always tell people to replace their Huygens eyepiece with a Kellner eyepiece because they were kind of the, the really good minimum uh, level quality of eyepieces. And that's kind of changed a little bit since then. So uh, this design was uh, uh, came from Carl Kellner in 1849. It's basically the first modern achromatic eyepiece. It has a little wider field than your Huygens. They are very cheap if you can find them. They do have, of course, some field curvature, and they are also pretty good for solar projection as long as they're not plastic. Now, this design, the orthoscopic, um, was really the eyepiece of choice throughout the 70s and the 1980s. These were invented by Ernest uh, Abbey in 1880, and they can be really excellent for planetary views. They have a narrow field of view, you know, bigger than a Huygens or Kellner eyepiece, but still, who cares about field of view when you're looking at the planets? You know, it doesn't matter. Maybe with the moon, but not with the, the planets. F field of view is irrelevant when you're looking at the planets. So um, these are really good for planets, but they are hard to find today. Uh, there used to be a company called University Optics in Ann Arbor, Michigan, that made these. And they shut down some time ago, but I heard they were back open, but I'm not sure if that's true or not. Today, the minimum quality eyepiece is the Plossel, uh, invented by George Simon Plossel in 1860, but it's Teleview Optics that made them really popular starting in 1980, because they sold like the first commercial Plossel eyepieces. And today, you can buy Plossel eyepieces for $20, $25, brand new. So on the used market, uh, you can get them for even less. But, you know, of course, if you pay a bit more, like, you know, 50 bucks, they'll be really good quality. So they have acceptable fields of view. They might have some reflections, but they are still today the industry standard. You know, many telescopes still come with plossels, at least the higher quality ones, not the department store garbage. And then there's the granddaddy 
of wide field eyepieces, which kind of dominate the market today. And that is the Erfel eyepiece invented by Heinrich Erfel in August of 1921. You can see they have multiple lenses now, up to five or more. They have really wide apparent fields of view, 60 to 70 degrees. They do have some stigmatism, you know, little, little funky stars on the edge. Uh, but if you can find an Erfel, they're pretty good. But again, like, like orthoscopics, they're a little hard to come by today. But kind of the successor to the Erfel are the Nagler eyepieces from Teleview Optics. Many companies have kind of reproduced these, but they are not as good as the, uh, you know, as the Naglers. So uh, they have multiple lens elements. This is just an example for one Nagler. They're all very different. All Naglers have an 82 degree field of view. Most have very few aberrations, if any. This is the major drawback is they are pretty heavy. So if you have a, a, a daub, uh, it might throw off the balance. And uh, they, they can be pretty expensive. You know, the, this eyepiece, which I mentioned earlier, is the 31 millimeter Type 5 Nagler eyepiece. That costs nearly $700 today. You could buy a 10 inch Dobsonian for the price of this eyepiece, but it is awesome to look through. Oh boy, uh, this eyepiece is so famous, it has nicknames. Some people call it the Terminagler, or um, some people call it the Holy Hand Grenade. <laughs> I've always called it the Warp Core eyepiece, because to me it looks like the Warp Core from the Enterprise D, but that's just me. <laughs> and this was invented by none other than Uncle Al himself, Al Nagler. Uh, and patented in 1979. And of course, they're, they're still really, really popular today. But Teleview's flagship eyepieces are now the Ethos. These were developed uh, principally from Paul Delache under the guidance of Uncle Al himself. And uh, they also have six to eight lens elements. Most have a hundred degree apparent field of view, while the, the, the shorter focal length ones can have a hundred and ten degree field of view. And when you look through one of these, you have to tilt your head back and forth to take in the whole field of view. This one here, the 21 millimeter ethos, this is a $900 eyepiece. We have one in our observatory and it is fantastic. I love it. So I've mentioned uh, these apparent fields of view. So how can you calculate the true field of view of these eyepieces with your telescope? So the true field of view can be approximated from the following formula. So you can uh, calculate the actual field of view with the apparent field of view, you know, as stated by the manufacturer with your magnification with that eyepiece. So remember, magnification is focal length of the scope divided by focal length of the eyepiece. So for example, what is the actual field of view of a 31 millimeter Nagler uh, used with a 200 or 2,350 millimeter focal length telescope? This, by the way, is the focal length of my uh, nine and a quarter inch Schmidt Cassegrain. So all Naglers have an 82 degree field of view this magnification is 76 power, and that gives me a true field of view of 1.1 degrees. So for reference, the moon, the full moon, has an angular diameter of one half degree. So I can fit a little over two full moons in this eyepiece. That's pretty good. That's a pretty decent field of view for a nine and a quarter inch Schmidt Cassegrain. And looking through these wide field eyepieces is like, you know, looking through the porthole of a spaceship. It is awesome. You know, they're expensive, but, you know, you, you get what you pay for. They are all really good quality. Now, all refractors or uh, Schmidt Cassegrains come with a diagonal. But, you know, maybe you want to upgrade or see what diagonal your telescope comes with. Maybe it's kind of a junky one and you might want to upgrade. So there are different kinds of diagonals. Uh, pretty much all uh, diagonals for nighttime use are 90 degrees. So all of these are 90 degree diagonals except this one here. So uh, with a refractor 
or a Schmidt Cassegrain, the diagonal is what gives you a mirror image. You know, left and right are flipped. But again, get over it. Uh, it really only you really only notice it with the moon. Uh, so as you can see from the picture here, I I show Orion because they nicely print what they are on the diagonal instead of being blank. But you can see there are uh, mirror diagonals. And there's a prism diagonal. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. This one's a prism. And uh, this one has a mirror. So uh, with mirror diagonals, they cost less to produce. Uh, the high quality views compared to a prism. Uh, they do not introduce any color errors to the image because, you know, with prisms, light passes through a prism. You might have uh, color issues where you might not have none before. And pretty much all mirrors today have dielectric coatings uh, that don't deteriorate. So, you know, you, you'll never have to replace your diagonal so long as you keep it covered up when you're not using it. But with prism diagonals, uh, they either use like a pentaprism or an Amici roof prism. That's not really important. Uh, but again, they may introduce chromatic aberration with short focal length refractors. That's why they're kind of falling out of favor today because many of us buy these short focal length refractors that the, the, the prisms can give more false color than what might be there. Uh, so prism, uh, prism diagonals work best with longer focal lengths, like with you know Schmidt Cassegrains or Maksudov Cassegrains. Now, if you want to turn your small refractor or uh, Schmidt or Maksudov into a spotting scope, then you want to get yourself a 45 degree diagonal because they give you a corrected image. So nothing's upside down or mirror imaged. So you can use your telescope during the day, but you can't really use a 45 degree diagonal at night because try to point your telescope at the zenith and see how comfy it is to look through a 45 degree diagonal. So 90 degree diagonals put the eyepiece in the more comfortable position to view through. So there are also uh, focusers you can uh, buy to replace your current focuser. Now, if you have one of these Schmidt Cassegrains with image shift, you can try to get one of these, replace the uh, focus knob that it comes with with one of these. But what I really recommend if you're uh, mount can handle the extra weight is I would get myself either a rack and pinion that has gears or a Crayford focuser that has no gears. You can put these focusers with the, with the proper adapter on the back of your Schmidt Cassegrain and you don't have to worry about image shift anymore. You might have to occasionally, you know, uh, use your uh, focus knob to uh, focus with a camera or short focal length eyepiece. But by and large, uh, you can use just a rack and pinion focuser. So yep, some focusers have gears, some are gearless. For astrophotography, uh, Crayfords can be better because they don't have any, you know, like uh, 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 like slop in the focus because it might take a second for the the two gears to engage with a rack and pinion focuser. With really well made ones, it's not an issue. The, these two here are from Starlight Instruments, and these are feather touch focusers, and they are the best focusers on the market today. But uh, Moonlight focusers, which are all Crayford focusers, are pretty good as well. And you can see there's even low profile focusers for like Newtonians. So uh, we're getting a little short on time here, but I'll quickly go through the other accessories available. Um, if you can't afford lots of eyepieces, you can maybe get one long focal length eyepiece, like maybe a, a 26 millimeter or a 40 millimeter, and you can use a Barlow lens. Barlow lenses have negative lenses that kind of artificially stretch out the focal length of your telescope. These were invented by Peter Barlow, uh, who was an English mathematician and physicist. And I mention that because people often give Barlow a lowercase b, but it was invented by a person, so uppercase b. Now, there's also a power mate from Teleview, and they basically do the same job as a Barlow. They, uh, they give you extra magnification in your eyepiece, but these use a positive lens as opposed to a negative lens of a Barlow. They have less uh, vignetting, and they do give a little better quality. Your, your, your telescope may come with a focuser already, but 
some smaller telescopes might come with like a six by 30 finder scope. The minimum size you should get is probably an eight by 50, eight by 50 or nine by 50. Some do have corrected images. You know, they, they don't show you things upside down like most finders do because most finders don't have a diagonal. So they show you things upside down. So this one would be upside down. This one would be mirror imaged. So yes, some do have little diagonals. These are great for Dobsonians, not so great for Schmidt Cassegrains, unless you keep them really low uh, on the tripod anyway. So uh, eight by 50 is the minimum finder scope you should use. And so you could replace larger ones if you want to, but uh, uh, much better, uh, at least for non-go-to telescopes uh, are one power finders. Uh, based off ones used for rifles, uh, amateur astronomers started using uh, red dot finders for telescopes. So now many telescope manufacturers have these little red dot finders. So quite simply, they do not magnify. So that's why they're called one power finders. And they have like a little dot projected on the screen here that you look through from like say this side and you point your dot in the part of the sky you wanna look at. But a little better, or much better really, are Telrad finders. Uh, so uh, short story here, I once sold an Aiden's Dob back when I sold telescopes. And one day he came into the store and said, I can't find anything with this Dob. I think I might want to return it. But I said, buy, buy one of these Telrads, buy these Telrad charts from skyspot.com that I talked about uh, in part three on binoculars. And uh, he came back and said, I can find things like crazy now uh, because uh, these are great. They give you these little concentric circles for a bullseye. Many uh, uh, planetarium programs like, you know, Starry Night or the Sky uh, can help you create custom charts with a Telrad site to scale. Or again, you can buy those charts from skyspot.com. They are great. Check the notes for a link, either part three notes or part four. Now, sometimes you don't have room for a long Telrad. So uh, Rigel Quick Finders have a shorter base. So these can be better for binoculars. Many people do use these on binoculars or maybe uh, shorter uh, refractors. The moon can be mighty bright in uh, telescopes, especially uh, pretty big telescopes like eight inches or bigger. So you can get yourself a moon filter, you know, basically, uh, you, you thread these onto the eyepiece and they, you know, they, they cut down light from the moon. Some are polarizing that you can adjust to different brightnesses, you know, because the moon can really change in brightness. It can be dimmer for a crescent, bright, brighter for a gibbous or full moon. So uh, some can be adjusted. When you look at the planets, uh, you can spend time switching out color filters. They do allow you to see different features even if I had time, I wouldn't bother to go through the benefits of every color, but it's in the notes. So check the back of the notes for the, you know, the differences uh, color filters can do. But there are special planetary filters for like Mars. Uh, Orion Telescope and Binoculars has a special uh, Mars filter. Uh, and it is really good. I tried it uh, during the last opposition in 2020 for the first time because 2018 was uh, dust stormed out and it is excellent. So if you want to view Mars during the next opposition here in like a year or so, or later this year, uh, get yourself a, a dedicated Mars filter from Orion. But all these do uh, something for basically every planet. There are lots of deep sky filters. And again, all these filters, moon filters, planetary filters, deep sky filters, these all thread on to the bottom of your eyepiece. So there are deep sky filters or broadband filters that help filter out natural sky glow or light pollution, uh, narrow band filters or UHC filters. They're for like emission nebulae or, you know, supernova remnants. O3 filters are for planetary nebulae and H beta filters are for, you know, some specific nebulae like the California Nebula, the Horsehead Nebula. So they each have their different applications. They can be a little expensive, but sometimes they're worthwhile. There are nights when I couldn't see, say, the Veil Nebula with no filter, 
but put on a narrow band or UHC filter and boop, there it is. And of course you can get a solar filter for your telescope. But remember, these solar filters go over the front of your telescope, over the front objective of refractors or with the front of Newtonians or schmidt cassegrains Never use a solar filter that threads on an eyepiece. If you have one of these uh, sun filters for eyepieces, get a hammer, smash the thing so it gets destroyed forever and ever. Never use one of these. They do not block out heat and they could crack on you and flood light in your eyes and damage it permanently. But these filters block out 99.999% of the visible light and all infrared and UV radiation. The screw-on filters don't do that, so don't use them. So they are uh, great to view solar activity, like sunspots, or you can view the partial phases you know, of a partial solar eclipse, or the entirety of an annual eclipse, or the partial phases of a total solar eclipse. So of course we have two coming up. We got the annual eclipse in 2023, and the total solar eclipse in 2024. Buy your filters early because come late 2023, 2024, they might be a little hard to come by. But you can also observe the sun and hydrogen alpha. This allows you to observe the chromosphere, a layer above the photosphere of the sun. Your standard solar filter shows you the photosphere. These show you the chromosphere. And so this allows you to view uh, the visible portion of the spectrum, but at specifically a wavelength of 656.28 nanometers, specifically hydrogen alpha, or uh, 6,562 angstroms, but that's not important. So this makes observing the sun dynamic because prominences and filaments can change within minutes sometimes. Pretty much everything we look at through a telescope is static, but not the sun in hydrogen alpha. Most uh, today are dedicated solar telescopes, but you can buy filters uh, separately, but you need the filter called an ethylon, and you need the diagonal, in this case called a blocking filter. You got to have both. And of course, they come with both. So uh, this one here, the 90 millimeter, from Coronado, this threads directly onto a Teleview 101 because with these uh, separate filters, you need like a, an adapter for your telescope. And sometimes those are, you can't really find them. You gotta have them custom made. So I would get yourself a dedicated solar telescope. For minimum, I would get one of these little Lunt 40 millimeters. I prefer the Lunt over the little uh, uh, Coronado PST myself. We have one of these for loan in the club here, but that was long before they had this one here. If we did it again today, we would get one of these. Now, real quick here, uh, there is this really cool dedicated solar mount. These only hold telescopes or, you know, H-alpha scopes or, you know, white light scopes with a solar filter up to 11 pounds, but they make, you know, solar observing very quick and portable because, you know, sometimes you don't want to haul out your massive telescope, you know, uh, just to look at the sun, because, you know, with the with the H alpha scope, that's all you can look at is the sun. So I want to get one of these. I don't have one, but this one is specifically meant for the sun. Uh, there's one sold by Skywatcher. In fact, they're, they're the ones that kind of came out with it. And theirs is called the Solar Quest. And but Orion has one that's identical. I mean, it's the same thing made in the same factory, just with different labels on them. For some reason, the Solar Quest costs five hundred and thirty dollars currently, while the Orion version is four hundred dollars. Why uh, uh, Skywatcher sells theirs for one hundred and thirty bucks more? I don't know, but uh, if I get one, I'll probably get one from Orion and save myself one hundred and thirty bucks. They have uh, built-in GPS. They have auto alignment and tracking. They do have a little joystick on the back that you can uh, press to precisely align it. And they have this little sensor to, you know, seek the sun. You know, it, it finds the sun automatically. 
So again, observing the sun in hydrogen alpha is spectacular because you can, you know, view uh, filaments and prominences and see them change in real time. Okay, finally for accessories, I've mentioned you might have to clean your uh, lenses or corrector plates or mirrors once in a while because of dew. But you can avoid that by using dew prevention. And of course, in Michigan, we got tons of dew here. And dew occurs when the actual air temperature falls to the dew point and you, you basically get wet. There are nights I have gone home soaking wet. I can remember some nights out observing where a beginner brings a Schmidt Cassegrain with no dew cap, and he was done in 20 minutes because of dew. So at minimum, get yourself a dew cap. Uh, many places sell these, but it's really easy to build one too. You can build one out of like a sleeping bag pad. I did that once. It was great until my dog ate it. <laughs> um, your tail rad might do up. So there's these little flip shields you can use to cover up the tail rad when you're not using it. But the best thing to do is to get yourself a dew prevention system. Many companies like uh, Kendrick, Thousand Oaks, or AstroZap sell dew controllers that you can uh, hook up these little uh, dew heaters to. They're basically ropes with wires that heat up the optics just above the ambient te uh, temperature so dew doesn't form on your lens or corrector plate or uh, you know, uh, your, 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 your mirror. Now with Newtonians, you can use a secondary heater over the secondary, but even your primary might do up. So they have uh, uh, versions of this that you can put on the back of your primary as well, because my primary and my Newtonian has dewed up plenty of times. And if you do get dew, uh, you can use one of these little dew guns. They use these to remove frost from the inside of your car uh, window. Um, you can use one of these to try to get the dew off. Or if you are at home, you can use you know, uh, a, a hairdryer. So dew is one of the great menaces of the night. And here's the other one. They are pure evil. Now, I am kind of going long here, but I'm going to go through this really fast because you might be thinking, is he really going to talk about the mosquito in a lecture on telescopes? Yeah, I really am. Uh, so uh, they evolved to their present form about 46 million years ago. They've been around a long time, and they ain't going anywhere. There are over 3,500 species. They occur everywhere in the world except Antarctica. It is the female mouth parts that are adapted for piercing the skin and sucking the blood. So women, am I right, guys? But, you know, women mosquitoes. <laughs> so, yeah, it's the females that bite you. And uh, they are considered the most dangerous animals on Earth because, like, around where I live, we have triple E, the eastern equine encephalitis that, that some people have got. Someone that I worked with in the planetarium here uh, passed away from this a few years ago. So, you know, um, this was what we were worried about before COVID. Uh, and we'll have to worry about Triple E, I guess, and, and COVID now, but oh well. And of course, they do have their natural predators like dragonflies, fish, if you're near, near a lake, and bats that are, account for about 1% of their diet. And we all know ways you can deter mosquitoes. So here are some WMDs to use, which are weapons of mosquito deterrent. There's mosquito repellent. Most of us use DEET. You only need 20 to 50% when you're uh, out three to four hours. Anything more than 50 doesn't do anything. But if you don't like DEET and all those chemicals, you can use Picardian, lemon eucalyptus oil, or IR3535. But if you don't want to try to put any of the stuff on at all, you can try one of these uh, mosquito repellent appliances called a thermocell. They have these little pads uh, that, that are scented uh, using a chrysanthemum plant. And they have a little butane canister that you ignite. So, they, so the, the pad gets hot and lets out a scent that repels mosquitoes. If you've seen one of these and wonder, do they work? I can personally attest they do work. Uh, it takes time to build up a perimeter, 
but they do work. There are lantern versions, but they're all white. I've always wondered if you can convert these to red lighting for like, you know, star parties or group viewing sessions. And of course, uh, there's plenty of other uh, things to do as well, but I'm not going to get into them here. I know there's mosquito repellent clothing you can get, but so on and so forth. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on these. I never do, but I always like to mention books. I love the Deep Sky Companion series by Stephen James O'Meara, one of the great visual observers around today. He has at least four that I know of today uh, on the Messier objects, the Caldwell objects, the hidden treasures, and the secret deep. Uh, every time I observe something uh, new or maybe for the hundredth time, I like to go to these and read what he saw and he talks about the history behind them and sometimes the science. So again, it helps you to understand what you're looking at, you know, through a telescope. It, it, it makes the views more meaningful. There's the Herschel 400 guide after the Herschel 400 program from the Astronomical League. Uh, there's the Annals of the Deep Sky, which is currently still in production. There are eight volumes th thus far. They don't describe every deep sky object in a constellation, but most of the big ones like, of course, the Orion Nebula, but he hasn't gotten to Orion yet, so I have no idea how many volumes there are going to be, but there's going to be a lot. The Night Sky Observer's Guides basically has, you know, you know, basically short observing notes for most targets. There are two volumes for, you know, uh, the Northern Hemisphere for all seasons, but there are, there are other volumes for, you know, the Southern Hemisphere now. There's even a fourth volume, but I don't recall exactly what the fourth volume is for. Just the, the last thing you got to remember is the best telescope is the one you use most often, right? It may not be the biggest. It may not be the most expensive. It may not have the best mount, uh, you know, it, but if it's the one that gets you to drag it out under the stars and observe, it is the best one you could use. Someone might say, why don't you get so-and-so telescope? And you can say, well, I like using this one. And so that's great. If it gets you under the stars, looking through a telescope instead of your TV or smartphone or computer, it is the best one you can own.